All right, welcome back for kind of part two, kind of not. If you missed the last episode, we talked about what to do when you just have IBS. So, you know, we talked about strategies, we talked a little bit about herbs and supplements, we talked about those unsexy, unglamorous basics again. And as promised, we said in this episode, we're going to talk about how to craft your perfect IBS diet. So the dietitian in the room is going to be pretty tickled with this one, I imagine. But I want to show you something that I pulled from the archives. And I think that this will be super relevant for today's discussion. Because we have an episode all about IBS diets, right? It's like episode 98 or so. It was right at the end of season one. We did an episode where we talked all about SCD, low FODMAP, some of the more common IBS diets. And we kind of poked holes in all of them to some degree or another. But I would like to start at at least the first 20 minutes or so of this episode talking about basic like nutrition 101. So if you were to go teach future dietitians or teach future nutritionists in a, a class, what kind of stuff would we talk about? Because honestly, the first thing is that we need to build nutrition for a healthy human being to function. Mm -hmm. And then we can talk about maybe customizing it for IBS. But look at this bad boy, I found this in the move. This is the course manual for nutrition 108. Uh, human nutrition. This is from the archives of undergrad. I think I took this class oh in like gosh. 2005. And I still have it for some reason that it eludes me right now. But you know, let's let's just take a quick peek at the table of contents. So when I say nutrition 101, getting back to basics, getting back to nutrition just for healthy human beings, I'm talking, you know, vitamins, minerals, are you getting enough carbs, protein, fat, fiber? Are you getting enough calories? Ooh, I like this. Even, even in 2005, they had a section here. Sugar, is it bad? So I think just really starting with those basic, you know, macro and micronutrients is a really solid place to start us off in this conversation. And then perhaps we can talk about customizing the diet for something a little bit more IBS specific. So dietitian in the room, you take it away. What do you want to talk about first? Yeah, I mean, probably just prefacing this whole conversation with everybody's going to be somewhat unique. So there's still a degree of experimentation when it comes to diet. Um, so having that in mind is helpful so that you're not trying to establish this is the this is the plan and I'm going to eat this plan and this is just what I'm going to stick with forever. Like so having some nuance and knowing if certain things changes change if certain goals change if you're working out a, a lot more that's going to change that what you're going to be doing nutritionally or it should change what you're doing nutritionally. Um and it might change uh that you need more of a certain macronutrient compared to another. So your nutrition, I think, again, like, majority of people need a certain degree of certain macros. So that would be like carbs, fats, proteins, calories, again, like, calories, essentially, is what what the macros make up your calories. So you have a certain level of energy that you need to function every day. That's what calories are. They're just energy. Um, so you have a certain amount of energy that you need each day and it can come from different things. So it can come from protein. It can come from fat. It can come from carbs. Um, alcohol is technically an energy too, but again, I don't usually. You don't want a lot of your calories right. coming from alcohol. No, we'll you just don't. say that. Um, so there's different ways that you could split this up. And typically I would say that would be where I would start so from a hierarchy of the questions that I ask my clients when trying to determine how to help them nutritionally, I would first and foremost ask them above anything else is, are you getting enough calories in? That would be the first question we would want to figure out. So if you're thinking of a hierarchy, that's question number one. Question number two would be, um, well, actually, well, could I would I pause you for go, a second. Go ahead. Though? Yep. When you say, are you getting enough calories? Mm -hmm. 
people could be sitting at home well, saying, and I, of course I am. Well, I wouldn't necessarily ask them that specifically. That would be like a question in my head is sort of, but yeah, yeah I, well, I, I know what you're saying. People could be asking this at home right now. So let's, let's take this bit by bit. Okay. How would you, def- how would you define enough calories? How would you find out if you are, or you are not taking in enough calories? Well, even before we get in the calorie conversation, because I missed another key thing that I usually try to figure out with clients is one, what is your relationship with food? So Mm. if you have a ton of food fears that are actually preventing intake and preventing you from getting calories up, that would be priority number one is to try to assess where you're at from a food relationship standpoint. Because if you're freaking out and scared of a lot of foods, which I get it, I've been there personally, it's going to be really hard to make sure that it's going to be really hard to nourish your, your body if you're in a state of fear around food. So first and foremost, if that's an issue, I would prioritize that heavily. Similarly, um, like, do you have an eating disorder or do you right. have any sort of disordered eating? You know, I, I'm working with somebody right now who has anorexia and it's it's been a challenging journey getting her to the point where she realizes that the under fueling is driving symptoms much more than she realized. Mm-hmm. Um, but even just like working through some eating disorder stuff and working with a therapist or a dietitian who really knows what they're doing with eating disorders. I just, I had another one. I don't know if I told you this, a woman uh, I started working with and she was very transparent that she had had some eating disorder stuff mm-hmm. before, but she thought she was past it. She thought she was over it. And when we looked at her chronometer data and the fitness data pulled in from her Apple Watch, it turns out she's running like a seven or 800 calorie deficit every single day. Right. It's like you thought that you were through the eating disorder, under eating kind of thing, but you're very much not. Um, yeah. Well, and, and that's an interesting dilemma because someone could, I don't know, someone could somewhat recover from disordered eating or an eating disorder where like anorexia tends to be there's bot there's usually body dysmorphia and and a, it tends to be more of a body image issue that's driving the the restriction not always but you know there could be an aspect of maybe their body image is a lot better but they're still like there's still the dysfunction where they're not getting up nutrition i think that's mm-hmm. rare usually i think they're going together but um there could still be instances where a lot of the psychological stuff has gotten better, but their actual nutrition, maybe unknowing to them is subpar. Because the hard thing is, which we can talk about calories, you know, we are taught, especially as women, less so I don't see it quite as bad in men, but it's still pretty common in men. But as women, we're taught to almost eat like birds. So to me, it's really common for people just to be under eating because that's what they've seen um, yeah, like other women doing. Acceptable. Right. So it's very interesting. Um, I do find that a lot of women under eat unintentionally. Um, and I was going to say that with the eating disorders too, is that these folks might have come a long way from you know, if they feel like they're out of the woods, as far as the eating disorder goes, Mm -hmm. like, like, again, my anorexia patient, and then the more recent one, I forget if she the second woman did say she had body dysmorphia issues, I think that she more so said she had binge eating Mm -hmm. disorder instead of anorexia. But uh, both of these women thought that they were like past that eating disorder, and they thought that they had recovered from it. And you know, and to some degree, they were in the sense that they were no longer eating 500 or 1000 calories a day, right. or they were no longer burning 2000 calories a day on a treadmill to try to lose weight. But they were still under eating, even though they were not intentionally doing so. But like to them, they feel like they're eating a ton of food when they're eating like right. sixteen or 1800 calories. And they just didn't realize that there was still so much of a deficit. Yeah, it and I I will say too, there's such a spectrum of what disordered eating is because there's outright eating disorders, but then I would say majority of my clients have some degree of disordered eating. Um sometimes again, it's more based of off of trying to avoid symptoms, typically with our clientele. So, 
Um, you know, sometimes the food fears are just so out of control. Um, maybe because they react to a lot of foods and maybe there's just so much dysfunction. Um, it'd be hard to not have some disordered eating or a poor yeah. relationship with food when you're symptomatic. And then other people, again, just are so nervous around foods because they've had past experiences, even though they probably could tolerate more. That's generally what I see. But there's such a spectrum here, too. So don't just assume because you don't have an eating disorder that there might not be some relationship kinks that are that that are present with your particular gut journey at this time. Yeah. Because usually most of my clients have some degree of disordered eating. Um, well, there was that survey that you sent me from, I think it was like 2012 or 2008 from UNC Chapel Hill. And when they surveyed, what was it, a thousand women, they found 10% of women had a history of an overt eating disorder, mm -hmm. like anorexia, bulimia, binge eating disorder. And then what was it like 75 or 80% of women had some degree of disordered eating, <laughs> right? I think it was 75, 75%, including the, the eating disorders yeah. had That's like, huge. again, disordered eating, eating, which is insane. I think so it's super common. Are, right. Chances are the majority of the people listening to this podcast right now have some degree of disordered eating. And right. again, to your point, it is understandable on some level because oftentimes the way it starts out is that you react poorly to a food and then you become a bit more fearful of the food and then you react again to that food and now you're extra fearful of the food or you go to a practitioner and they tell you that the food is bad or it's going to feed the SIBO, it's going to feed the candida, et cetera, et cetera. And then that plays into it. So it, it kind of, it tends to start a little bit gradually and for very logical reasons in that it just snowballs out of control. Um, I think also the internet, the internet makes us fearful of a lot of foods too. Like mm -hmm. there are a lot of vegan Instagrammers and YouTubers and influencers who will straight up tell you that, that meat is evil and terrible and you're going to have a heart attack and die if you have meat. But then you have the people in the carnivore camp who are like judging you for eating any vegetables whatsoever because plants are all evil and bad and you only need to eat steak and salt for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the keto people are just like squirting oil in their mouth in the background. It, it just, it doesn't make sense. But a lot of these diets build their following from fear mongering. Mm -hmm. Like the paleo people, paleo would not have skyrocketed the way that it did 10 years ago, had it not been for the fear mongering element of that diet. Mm -hmm. Grains are bad. Grains are evil. Our ancestors didn't eat grains. I can't believe you would eat grains. What are you doing? They're inflammatory. If it wasn't for that messaging, paleo never would have taken off the way it did. And similarly, keto would not have taken off the way it did if it wasn't for this conversation of like, carbs are poison, carbs are bad, carbs are evil. I can't believe you're eating carbs. Carbs cause cancer, et cetera, et cetera. So um, yeah. just the internet and the health space is going to do that to you. Yeah. So I, again, I, I, there's, I think having a, taking a step back at first and just assessing where your relationship with food is at. And, um, again, I think that it's probably normal for some people to have some food fears and to just acknowledge that and to try to work on that makes sense or try to do a few activities to help, um, help you around your food mindset. I think it's like a good place to start. Now, again, the second question to ask, like I had mentioned was, are you getting enough nutrition from a total standpoint, which would be calories? So like, are you getting enough energy in? Because if that isn't, where it needs to be, that's going to be problematic. Um, and I would say most people are not getting enough cal calories in based on what I've seen historically working with IBS clients. Um, I would say probably 80 or 90% are under. Um, and a lot of them are unintentionally under. Um, yeah. Or some of them, again, want to gain weight or add calories in are struggling symptom wise. So there's a there's different flavors of this, but yeah, I feel like under, under calories is such a huge problem. And part of it could be that 
a lot of people go to more whole food nutrition, which in some ways is great. But if you're moving from more of a standard American diet where you're eating a lot of breads and you're eating a lot of more, um, you're eating more hypercaloric foods and then you remove everything and then Mm. you're adding in foods with maybe more volume and lower calories, it's very easy to be under fueled. So yeah. Yeah. um, That's a valid point. And, and again, it's not to say that broccoli is bad or salads are bad, anything like that. But the reality is it's easier to meet your caloric need when you have calorie dense foods that happen to be delicious. Also, can I rat you out? Can I expose you for a second? I feel like you're going to be okay with this, but just, oh I'm going to poke fun at you. So with breastfeeding, you have mm. lived this, right? I think I know eat, where you're going with you this. You eat fairly healthy. You're mm-hmm. a freaking dietitian. I would hope you eat fairly healthy, <laughs> but you live your life and you have some treats as you should, but you have been needing so many more calories because of the breastfeeding thing. Mm-hmm. And you revealed to me just a couple months ago, what is the food that you're like, I'm just going to eat this every now and then, like <laughs> on days that you work out and you're like, screw it. I just need calories right. at this point. You've been eating ice cream, ice cream. Yep. And it's true. It is calorically dense. It's mm-hmm. freaking delicious. But how <laughs> funny is that? That, you know, here you are, you're like, And I was joking with you for a long time. I was texting you in the beginning of your breastfeeding journey. And I was like, I don't know, just chug lard, man. Chug lard. Well, yeah, I, I, so what I noticed was that I have a lot of blood sugar swings, both during the end of my pregnancy, it got kind of more intense. And then postpartum, I've had a lot of blood sugar swings. And I think my body was in such like a hyper metabolic state. And I think everyone is to some extent, but I don't know. I I lost weight really quickly postpartum. Um, And again, which is funny. Some people would like love that. Like I even asked my doctor, I'm like, is this okay? Like, I feel like I've dropped like 15 pounds within two weeks, but it was a little startling because I was losing so quickly. And I just feel like I had an oversupply. So I think I, I probably need an additional seven or 800 calories just for the breastfeeding part. Um, plus again, with having a baby, I'm like rocking her all the time, walking her all the time, doing a lot of active things. Plus I added in tennis about three months ago, I, three or four months ago, I've been playing a lot of tennis, which if you play 60 to 90 minutes of tennis, you're burning like five or 600 additional calories. So I, I was feeding. It was, it was getting insane where I almost couldn't tolerate tennis because I couldn't get the calories in. And so I'm just, I was talking to Nikki saying, I don't know how else to just slam. I mean, I could do it. It's just the simplest solution for me would be just anytime I'm playing tennis, I'm going to eat some ice cream after and yeah. just, and it's worked out like I, it's so strange. I feel better getting calories that way even if there is some sugary, not nutrient-dense foods in the mix, I feel a lot better, especially the following day. My blood sugar feels more balanced. I sleep better. Getting more food in, like getting 3,000, at least 3,000 calories a day in if I'm working out and playing tennis um, and adding a little bit of of the uh, ice cream in, then not doing that. Um, but again, I think a lot of people would not do that. A lot of people would think, well, a oh lot no, of the ice would cream just say would be- ice cream is bad. I like, right. I can't believe you would eat that. Ugh. Right. For sure. And like, oh, that's going to be inherently like inflammatory. No. Yeah. And well, and you would think that it would inherently screw up your blood pressure or your blood right. sugar too. And right. here you are saying, no, the following day, your blood sugar is way better off <laughs> because you consumed adequate calories. Right. Right. So like for me, the calorie point is so crucial for stability, whereas maybe someone else, it wouldn't be like that. But I did notice even on days where I didn't eat as well, but I ate a lot, I felt better. Um, so yeah, it's strange. And, and I, it's funny you bring this up too, because sometimes I have to have conversations with people that um, are pretty strict dietarily, I'm looking at what they're eating and they're eating a ton of vegetables and like a ton of fruits, which isn't a bad thing. But you're getting like 10 calories from it. Right. And I, it's so weird as a dietitian and I, they think it's weird where I'm like, maybe dial back some of these non-starchy vegetables a bit. 
and add in more starches, add in more food, add in more food that's going to have add some calories to the mix. Yeah. Um, and fill you up a bit too. Right. Right. Um, so I just had an epiphany, by the way. Hmm. And okay, so a couple of years ago, I worked with this girl. She was a student at UNC. And um, one of the things I remember about her story very distinctly was she was either a vegan or she was very close to vegan. And she was in a sorority. And it was one of those, like, she lived in the sorority house and they had a chef or something. Mm -hmm. that I don't know if that's a normal thing for sororities, right. but um, they had a chef or a cook or whatever that made their meals. And, you know, she would eat great big salads and green smoothies and, you know, quinoa, and like all of these healthy meals. And she had IBSD, like mm -hmm. diarrhea, and bloating, and she felt like crap. And then one, at one point in working together, she went on spring break, spring break, I think, and she went to the Outer Banks with some of her college buddies, and she said she felt fantastic. But they pretty much sustained themselves on beer and pizza, and I think that was it, <laughs> like mm -hmm. nothing else. And she was like, how does it make sense that I eat healthy and I feel like shit and I'm pooping my brains out? But then I go on vacation and I'm eating actual garbage right? and I feel great. And I had normal bowel movements the entire time. And I remember at the time we were speculating it was one of two things or probably a combination. A, there's the whole bottle of like feeding the SIBO and maybe, maybe the excess fiber that she was consuming was feeding the SIBO versus when she was eating bona fide junk, it wasn't feeding the SIBO so much. And then I also pointed out, you know, when you're on vacation, you have lower mm. stress and, right. you know, you're living your best life and you're hanging out with your friends and you don't have exams and things, things, you don't have real world stressors stressing you out when you're on vacation. So a lot of people feel better on vacation versus mm -hmm. when you go back to school and, you know, there's probably some degree of like drama with friend groups and you have exams and papers due and you know, you just get bogged down by stressors. And now hearing you, I'm realizing another piece of the puzzle is probably that she wasn't getting enough freaking calories on yeah. a regular basis. Here she is eating smoothies, green smoothies and giant salads and trying to be healthy. She's probably under eating, which I don't, I don't mean to judge a group of people I don't have any interaction with. But if I had to bet, I would bet not only sorority houses, but also things like cheerleading and gymnastics. I bet that these are groups of women who are particularly vulnerable to disordered eating, mm -hmm. right? Like being just surrounded by, by there, these. There is some research to that. Um, I think cheerleading and gymnastics ballet certainly. as well. Ballet. Oh my God. Yeah. Dance for sure. Ballet. Um, I, I actually was, I did a, a um, I did a little workshop at a ballet company here and I've worked with a, I've worked with a, ba a sub ballet dancer and it is insane to me. So the ballet company that I worked with did, um, they had classes from young age to people in their company. Um, mm -hmm. And it was funny because the owner kept being like, yeah, we just like really try to promote a healthy relationship with food because, you know, in ballet, there's such a high prevalence of eating disorders. But then she would say stuff that would push eating disorder. Like she would say, ah, I wish someone, I wish she would just eat better so then she'd lose. Like she would say stuff that would promote eating disorders mm, in young yeah. girls. And it was just kind of crazy to listen to her because sometimes they're totally oblivious it's so built into that culture yeah. um and the other thing is too the the person that i worked with individually that was in a dance company she was dancing six hours a day and they like wouldn't really take lunch breaks they were just basically snacking that's brutal during the middle of the day and it's crazy so yeah, yeah. i think yeah. any any 
sort of sport or profession where you're on display. Sorority, I could see as well. There's I'm just te- thinking like a, a big enough group of young women. College girls in college general. College girls. Teen like, girls. Yeah, I could just see a big enough group of college-ish or high school-ish age girls that kind of being a breeding ground potentially too, regardless yeah. of the sporting part of it. Another group uh, too that I know you, we have talked about more recently privately is men, men, but also men who are like a bigger stature. Mm. So I don't think men have as high a prevalence of overt eating disorders, but if you're like a big, tall dude, you're going to be surprised how many calories you actually need to sustain your metabolism, right? Like we, we've been working uh, with somebody recently and what it like, he needs like 3000 calories a day or something crazy. Right. And he right. was not anywhere near that. Yeah, that's the thing. It's crazy working with dudes because just the sheer volume of calories that they need. And it's crazy because some dudes can hit that. Some dudes are having no tr- problem getting 3000 calories in. But then you have others that just aren't paying attention to it and are doing SIBO based diets. And it's really hard to get 3000 calories in if you're yeah. eating a sweet potato, broccoli, and a chicken breast at each meal. So it's, I think that inherently some of the SIBO-esque diet or even whole foods diets are going to inherently be a little bit more low calorie. Mm -hmm. They don't have to be. I mean, there's different ways you could maneuver it to get calories up, but it takes way more work than if you're eating more junky food. And that's not to say do what I do of eating ice cream, but um I mean you can y- have Doritos instead. That's right. okay. Right. Well, again, it, it's people could focus on pretty highly nutrient dense foods, eating some snacks, eating some treats occasionally, but yeah, I think it it is really interesting the sheer volume of calories that, you know, a 6 foot 2 210 pound dude's gonna need compared to you know a five foot three 120 pound woman so um i definitely have seen some guys that under eat and um yeah it's really it is interesting um but yeah i I, it's weird because there's this subset of of people that we work with that get like very little calories just being on a SIBO, more SIBO diet. Maybe they're eating a ton of rice. Um, And then there's not that rice is inherently bad or anything, but some people that aren't really eating tons of vegetables um, or they're sticking to the lower fiber ones versus some people I work with are eating a ton of vegetables to the point where I, it might be impeding their cal their calories. Um, so it is interesting. You'll get two sides of the coin. Some people are eating really high, high fiber I've seen. And it's like, maybe we need to cut that just a little bit so that I've you seen that with vegans and vegetarians, especially where it's right. like, okay, you're doing good champ, but maybe too good. Right. Exactly. <laughs> like, let's like, and again, the one that I always joke about, and I kind of use as a litmus test sometimes when I talk to people is I, I've jokingly called it the Dorito test. So I remember the first time I did, I think it was the first time I did this. It was one of the FODMAP Freedom like group Q and A's. And we're talking and one of the students was asking some questions. And in that moment and previously, I was getting this very strong, like, ooh, eating, disordered eating kind of vibe from her. Like you could just tell the stuff she was saying, like, grains are inherently bad and inflammatory and sugar is inherently bad and inflammatory and, and like bone broth is inherently good and heals everything. And there was just, there was a lot of like dogmatic black and white, good and bad kind of stuff that she was saying. And finally, at one point on one of the Q and A's, I forget how it came up, but I, I looked at her and I said, how would you feel if I told you to eat a Dorito? And the look of shock and horror and terror on her face was very entertaining for me, but it was very diagnostic, right? If if the thought of eating a single Dorito is legitimately terrifying to you, 
Or if, mm. if the thought of eating a piece of candy is truly horrifying to you, then I think that's a red flag for disordered eating personally. Cause yeah. again, you're breaking these, th- these foods into good and bad camps. And again, like you're going to be scared to eat a food if you've labeled it as bad or inflammatory, or you think it's going to cause cancer or something. And, right. you know, I just, I kind of t- took that opportunity to talk about, to her and the group about, you know, I personally believe that everybody's goal should be to be able to eat a little bit of everything. Right. You know, it's not to say that you eat Doritos every single day, or even every week. But if you were to eat something like that as a treat, hopefully you're strong enough and resilient enough. And you have a good enough relationship with food that you would have the confidence to know you wouldn't explode in into a, like a fiery ball of flames. Right. Um, so yeah, I, I think, um, I think we might've covered the disordered eating bit and maybe the calories fairly well at this point. I will throw out, I know you've said you think that they undershoot a little bit, but just even getting a quick ballpark on something like chronometer or kind of really rough and dirty Google search and finding what your calorie need might be would probably yeah, I mean, be a I good place to start just to get a ballpark. A, chronometer is a start. You can upload some of your physical activity data to make it a little more accurate. So there's different ways that you could do it, but it could give you a, a sense because what you're trying to determine is right. How much you're, how many calories you're putting in and how many calories you're taking out by burning the calories throughout your day by yeah. moving and how, yeah, your so organs working and right. Your, so your baseline metabolic need plus right additional for any activity that you might do. So if you work out a ton, you're going to need a ton of calories. Right. My husband still, Oh, sorry. I was going to say my husband still makes fun of me because when we first started going out, I was rowing and you know, we would row for like two and a half hours every morning. We would do a three mile run for a warm up before we got in the boat. And then we would row for like two, two and a half hours. And then we were supposed to do a second workout in the afternoon most days. So we were working out a ton. And I got to a point, I thought it was normal for a person to eat an entire box of pasta. Yeah. Like that was just, that was the volume of food I ate. Right. And when I first had him over for, you know, the first like, come over to my place and I'll cook for you type date, Um, I was making the spaghetti and I got out two boxes of spaghetti and Mike was like, what are you doing? I was like making spaghetti. And he's like, how much? (laughs) I'm like, well, one for you, one for me, obviously. And he's like, no, 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 no. Like this, I I don't, I'm not going to eat that much. You're going to have leftovers if you eat that, if you do that much. But yeah, I, I would just, you know, one box of spaghetti. Well, it's, it's funny too, because I like that you were just full on going to eat your big your big meal regardless of mike whereas i feel like again yeah. sometimes when people are on dates they just don't eat very much you're just you were just balls to the walls oh, no yeah. matter what which i love and i made him meatballs even though i had been a vegetarian for like 10 years at that point and i oh. didn't know how to cook meat at all and i cooked the ever loving crap out of the meatballs and they were dry <laughs> as all get out because I didn't want to undercook them. I felt like that was a bad right, thing. But right. I had no idea how to gauge if they were done. So I right. made homemade meatballs and then I just... Like, well, just stir some tomato sauce or something on them. Like, like soften them up. Yeah. Well, Mike tolerated them. He way later told me, yeah, they weren't very good. Oh, um, God. But he did eat them to his credit. And then my roommate, who had incredibly low standards for food, she ate the rest of them. And she thought they were the greatest things ever. Oh, she my She thought gosh. I was a wonderful cook. So Everyone needs everyone needs the low bar culinary friend to, to hype yes. you up. But I introduced said friend to Tuna Helper. And her world opened up. She was... It, her world just was revolutionized. Oh. She had never heard of Tuna Helper. She had never had it. And I kid you not, she would cook Tuna Helper after that at least twice a week. Sometimes she would cook it for breakfast <laughs> and eat it for breakfast. Oh, my God. So we would, my other roommate, and I would come back from practice at like 8, 8.30. And we would walk in the building. And I remember the one time we walked up the stairs to our apartment complex. And we we're like what is that? And we're debating all the way up the stairs and we're like, it's fishy. Is somebody eating fish at eight o'clock in the morning? Who's, who's 
eating fish at eight o'clock in the morning. And we open the door to our apartment and there's our roommate. She's like, hey guys, want two to help her? And we're like, oh God. Oh God. No, I think I'm going to barf just thinking of that at eight o'clock in the morning. Thank you though. <sighs> oh God. Well, I think once... Once You're trying you, to recover from the two right, I'm trying story. to re recover from this. Once you do know, well, if calories are insufficient, it leads to another question of where your macro is falling, because that'll help you determine maybe what would be the best macronutrient to try to increase calories. So true. Um, I have another thought too, just really yeah. quickly. Yeah. If calories are insufficient, the first step could be to just eat more of the foods right. you're currently tolerating. True. So like if you're not tolerating FODMAPs, we're not necessarily saying you start with guacamole and onion dip and French onion soup. Maybe you start with some of the low FODMAP foods that you're currently doing really well with and you just increase the dose, if you will. Um, right. But continue, because I like the idea of looking at your macros and figuring out how to target that a little bit more. Yeah, so usually when I have a client that does chronometer and I'm seeing that calories are insufficient, usually what I will do is look at where their protein's falling, where their carbs are falling, and where their fat's falling, and see if there's any bigger gap that needs to be filled. Because that is where you're going to get the calories. To in That's where you're going to make up the calories, is with your macro, with shifting around macros. Um, now, some people might have generally pretty balanced macros. They just need to eat more, like what you're saying. They just need it more of what they can tolerate and maybe have bigger portion sizes, whereas other people have bigger gaps. So if they're a little bit lower on the carb side, I might say you need to add in an extra serving or, of, or two of starch or like an extra fruit and an extra starch. So I'll try to give more specific guidance on what to potentially add in. Um, Question. Yes. Do you ever see people who are deficient in fat other than vegans? Yes. So okay. I'm surprised with all like keto being the buzz. Not, I'm surprised that that it's, happens. It's very rare. I'm thinking of one client um, comes to mind where we've been slowly trying to add fat in. So she had her gallbladder removed and went very low fat and feels like now she has totally lost tolerance to fat. Um, so it's hard because if you don't eat fat, your bile dries up. Like it, it, you won't produce a ton of bile. Like your body's smart. It's going to downregulate things if you're not utilizing bile. And so it can lead to more sludge if you're not eating fats. So it can lead to more deficiencies in terms of your ability to digest fat. So she's in this weird conundrum where she's struggling to increase fat, in my opinion, enough to really facilitate bile flow. Um, and gets, gets pretty triggered if she goes over a certain fat threshold. So I have had some clients that are a little bit too low fat or too, yeah, too low fat, but that would be more the scenario. I feel like if they've had their gallbladder removed and I've just been a little bit yeah, extra if they, careful. If they have a specific reason to avoid fat yeah. versus, versus like just the IBS clan in general right. tends not, to not be deficient in fat. Cause again, everybody true. talks about freaking keto. Well, and I would say typically fat as well. Sometimes there is sometimes where I feel that people have a fat threshold. So sometimes people notice if they eat a little bit too much fat, they don't feel good. And I don't know if that's necessarily um, like struggling to digest the high degree of fat or just that other macros are lo too low. Because mm -hmm. um, if you're really ratcheting up the fat, your carbs or your protein could be too low. Um, I don't know. So there could be different scenarios for that. But well, I know but I know, too, there's also this idea that fat slows down motility more than the other mm -hmm. macros. So it yeah. could be that if you're consuming more fat than is is your threshold, you're slowing down motility that much more, potentially. Yeah, I would say I, I think sometimes when people are over about 40% of their calories from fat, not always the case, but I would say like, that's where that's where generally I would look um, when I review the chronometer, like what percentage of their calories are coming from fat 
right around that 40% seems to be where things go more awry. But <clears throat> again, it varies still. So some people could eat more than that and be fine, whereas other people, you know, have to be a little more careful of that line. I think the other thing to think about is, okay, typically though, I would say typically fat is usually something that fills in the gap of getting enough carbs. Like once you get enough carbs, once you get enough protein, fat's just like the leftover component, if that makes sense. So it's not as much something that I say you need this amount of. Now there could be an upper limit for some people. Um, but usually with carbs and protein, I have like a goal amount. Um, that so, makes sense. And then any additional fat that you might add, it's more for like the calorie sake right. versus the fat itself. Right. So I would say too, that there has been some times where I've worked around saturated. I've tried to lower saturated fats to see if it affects cholesterol levels or something like that with clients. But typically, again, I'm not doing tons of work with fats. More often than not, I'm working on protein and carb intakes. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, well, and what was, oh, I feel so rude right now. We had a guest on and she was lovely. Kayla? Yeah. Kaylee right? uh, McDevitt. Kaylee. Yeah. Um, and we were talking about a lot of people probably need like a hundred grams of protein for healing purposes. Yeah. And it's interesting too, because the dietetics world, the conventional dietetics world, in my opinion, majorly undershoots protein in general, I'm pretty sure their guideline is, and I could be wrong because it's been a while since I've been in school, is 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram, which yeah. it really is not that much. Yeah, you're right. That is, um, a, and then it's like up to 1.2 grams per kilogram if you do like heavy weightlifting and such. Right. Which again, is not that much. So yeah, I tend to see people needing at the very minimum, 0.5 grams per pound. So that would be like my minimum minimum. But most people, I think, do better higher than that. Like yeah. I would say 10 to 20 grams higher. I think um, that's about spot on. Because when I've yeah. done my chronometer tracking, I'm so I'm again, recall, I'm six feet tall, and I'm not a petite built person. I'm right. pretty muscular. Um, and I've got maybe like five or seven pounds of COVID fluff that I could lose still. But I'm like 190, like somewhere between 190 and 195. And mm -hmm. generally, I try to shoot for right about that 100 gram of protein right. per day mark. And it is, it's genuinely challenging, even with about a 2000 calorie a day allotment mm -hmm. for me to play with or right. like 2100 somewhere in that range, because I'm tall. Um, right. It's, it's genuinely challenging to get that much protein. Right. in a day, let alone to like hit the mark every single day and, and have enough for healing. And interestingly, I, I don't know if this would merit a full episode, maybe down the road, but hair loss is a pretty big complaint among people who have gut problems. Mm -hmm. um, I know I've, I've watched a lot of videos and I did a little mini course. Like as a student, I watched a mini course about hair health and a lot of hair experts say that you need to get a bare minimum of 100 grams of protein per day to facilitate hair growth. Yeah. So it makes you wonder, is it like the inflammation from the gut and the microbiome kind of stuff and the SIBO causing the hair loss, which I think a lot of people believe? Or is it the fact that you're totally undershooting protein mm -hmm. and you you don't have enough of this critical macronutrient to build healthy hair. Yeah. Yeah, and I it's interesting because in the conventional dietetic space there is a a notion that you need more protein when you're healing. So people that have had burns or um surgeries, they need more protein. Um so there is that notion. Um I think they undershoot even probably that too, from a protein needs standpoint. But yeah, protein typically, I would probably shoot at the absolute bare minimum of 0.5 grams per, per pound of body weight, probably more, more, you're better off getting an extra 10 to 20 grams on top of that. Mm -hmm. um, but that would be the bare minimum, I would say. And I would, um, I would say, um, 
Oh man, I I had a brain fog moment, a brain fart moment. Oh, now I can't remember what I was gonna say. Hmm. It'll come back. What It'll about, come back. Why don't we pivot around. momentarily to carbs? Yeah. Um, I know we've talked about low T3. On oh, I remember what testing. it was. Can we can we go back? Yeah. Just the only thing I was gonna say was if you are vegetarian and vegan, you need more than that. <laughs> oh, yep. Because you are not going to be utilizing those amino acids as efficiently in your body. Um, a lot of plant sources are not as bioavailable. Um, yep. So, which it's really challenging because it's already hard enough to get protein up. Um, when you're on a more vegetarian ve- vegan diet, it's not impossible. I've definitely done it with some, more particularly with vegetarian clients. Um, but yeah, it's it's more of why I don't really do many vegan vegan clients anymore i pretty much don't work with vegans just because it's really hard to get to get protein up um well iron and probably zinc as well but iron um i've seen vegans who are eating 150 percent of their daily value of iron on chronometer but their ferritin still sucks right and of course, the temptation that people go towards is I have malabsorption. Oh, my God. And it's, right. it's like, no, you have to account for the fact that the iron that you are choosing to consume is far less bioavailable than right. the iron that you could eat if you had a burger or a steak or some clams or oysters or whatever. And actually, I know now that I'm saying this, the same is true of zinc. I forget the metric, but I remember I attended a lecture about zinc and I believe that and this woman researches zinc full time. That's her job. And mm-hmm. two of the things she said, one was that there's no good measurement for zinc. So, you know, plasma, whole blood, RBC, doesn't matter. They're all inaccurate. Uh, right. Of Tissue biopsy would be the way to really assess zinc, but they don't do that clinically. That's more of a research thing. Mm-hmm. So A, there's no good way to measure zinc. You just have to put two and two together from your diet. But um, I think she said that plant-based sources of zinc are about 40% less bioavailable than Mm. uh, animal-based zinc sources. So vegans and vegetarians need to increase their zinc by about 40, 50%. So again, perhaps 150% of your daily value. Yeah, that's where it gets way more challenging from a vegetarian especially vegan like if you are eating some animal foods you can probably get by it still would be challenging i think but vegan it's it's really tough um and we probably don't even know all the ins and outs of what you're saying like each nutrients bioavailability bioavailability from a plant source to an animal source but um yeah but it's it is um it is I just wanted to point that out, but we can move on to carbs too. I know you were kind of yeah, running yeah, well, with some ideas there. Well, again, I mentioned um, hypothyroidism, particularly low T3. We've both seen is associated with insufficient carb intake. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we both would agree that women in particular should probably not go low carb, uh, yeah. particularly menstruating women. Um if you you know if you're postmenopausal maybe that could be a conversation I'm not really sure actually because I I don't necessarily have expertise in that arena um, I think that generally speaking men tolerate lower carb diets better than women it's not to say that they should do that but they tolerate it better mm-hmm. and true. in my opinion I really don't think that women should go super low carb yeah I'm in agreement with you I I it's some it's something that uh, is getting better. I see over time. I don't think people are as low carb as they were when I first started in, as a diet, as working with people with IBS. Um, there was definitely a, a much more low carb slant that I don't see as strong now, um, which is interesting, but there's a lot of negative hormonal and immune system and nervous system implications that happen when you go too low carb and your body can cope with that. Your body can maintain blood sugar levels. 
on a low carb diet by promoting, by doing gluconeogenesis, which requires cortisol. It requires this whole, um, process to, to get around. So there are things that the body can do to maneuver if carbs are a little low, but you don't really want to be stuck in a st state relying on gluconeogenesis to maintain blood sugar levels all the time. You don't, you don't yeah. want to be relying on your body's plan B all the time. It's so like driving around town for years with a spare tire on your car. Right. Does it work? Technically? Yes. Yeah. Is it as good for the car? Absolutely not. Yeah. So and it, it's, it's interesting though. I, I, I think, um, again, the, 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 the degree of how many carbs you need also, I think varies a lot person to person. Um, I would say usually I'd recommend it, at least someone's getting 150 grams of carbs in, but more than likely more than that. Um, like if someone's coming to me from a lower carb state, I will say, let's get you to around 150 grams. And that could change depending on size. Um, but I'm, I usually work more so with women. So if a woman came to me and they were a little bit more low carb, um, maybe 150 grams would be a good starting point to shoot for. Let's get her to that point and see how she feels. And then determine, do you feel better if you bump that up to like 150 to 200 grams? Do you feel mm -hmm. better at the upper limit of that? Do we keep pushing forward? Um, and keep go even higher than 200. Now, if someone's really active, I definitely think 150 is insufficient, mm -hmm. especially if they're doing anything that's moderate to high intensity. Um, and can I interrupt you for a second? Yeah, go ahead. Some people at home might be thinking that, oh, it's a myth that you need carbs if you exercise. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm just going to go back to the analogy I painted before. Are there athletes who kick absolute ass and they are doing keto. Yes. There are also athletes that kick ass and they're vegan. We've mm -hmm. also, you know, you've seen these, these like posts where it's some beefy muscular 300 pound <laughs> dude, right? Like muscles on top of muscles on top of muscles. And the whole story is about how he's a vegan and he's like petting a bunny rabbit or something. Right. Just because there are people who could do that doesn't mean that that's appropriate for you. That doesn't mean it's appropriate for the masses. It doesn't even mean that that's the best diet for them. Maybe beefy biceps on top of biceps on top of biceps guy, maybe he would be even stronger if he ate a burger every now and then. I don't know. And similarly, you know, the example that that I come up with for the keto side of this is Mike Mutzel. Mike Mutzel is a nutritionist in the functional space, and he's really, really wicked smart. And he's been doing keto for a lot of years, and he was a competitive mm. cyclist, and he still works out a ton, and he is thriving with that diet. But another thing, too, is that, A, again, just because it works for him doesn't mean it works for you. Mm. But another thing is you don't know exactly what their diet and their routine looks like. So when Mike Mutzel says that he does keto – versus average Joe Jane America, when they say they do keto, those are completely different things, right? Like the average Joe Jane America is eating a lot of dairy, a lot of like butter and cheese and, and that sort of sources of fat. A lot of people are overly relying on things like fat bombs, which is where you mix like coconut oil and nut butters together. And it's just it's a quick grab and go. A lot of people are over relying on less healthy or convenience forms of fat, and then they're just eating a whole buttload of salad. And they're eating kind of the same thing every day because maintaining a diet like that is really, really hard. Mike Mutzel, if you follow his stuff, especially like five or so years ago, he would share, he and his family maybe eat meat like twice a week. So he, it's a much more plant-based version um, I don't think he did a ton of dairy for his fat sources. He really relied a lot more on olive and avocado and plant-based fats and like nuts and seeds. Um, he would eat just mountains of vegetables every day and, and like unique vegetables, you know, he would, you know, you would see little slices of all sorts of different things, tons of variety for the microbiome in 
every salad and every vegetable dish he would do. And then he would be really generous with the fat or he would have, you know, like avocado and nuts and seeds and stuff on top of that. So again, like we think that we can trust when people say I'm doing this diet, but you have no idea how they're implementing that diet. Similarly, I had a guy who I had recommended, uh, like trying low histamine and he dropped off the face of the earth and I didn't hear from him again, but he was the friend of another patient. And I touched base with her at some point and she was like, well, (laughs) I keep telling him he needs to go back in to see you because his version of the low histamine diet, he whittled his diet down to like three foods. Mm. And he was eating the same exact meal every single day. And it wasn't out of fear, actually. It was just, he was like, oh, this is easy. Whatevs. And and he was just going through life like that, apparently. But again, this this other patient, this friend of his was trying to say like, no, you can't do that. That's really bad for you. You need diversity. You need to try to like add more variety into your diet. But he was a guy who didn't really like vegetables to begin with. Right. And he just saw the restriction as an excuse to do this super easy version of this diet. Right. But again, if you asked him, he would say he was doing the low histamine diet. Right. That versus like what Yasmina used to do with lots and lots of lots of fresh produce and emphasis on nutritional diversity. Like those are two different things. So anyway, right. Tangent yeah. though that may have been. Well, it's interesting you were talking to about like how athletes can do keto. There's a really good podcast. I actually found it. Um, because it's super, super interesting. I remember being like, oh my gosh, this is so interesting. Was this it was the back in two th- podcast? No, it was back in 2017. I remember listening to this episode, but it's a Chris Master John uh, Mastering Nutrition podcast episode. It's episode 33. It says, can fat fuel the athlete? So he analyzes a whole bunch of, um, a couple articles or a number of articles and just the science around like keep going keto and if that could help performance. Um, and essentially what he found is that keto can be helpful if you're doing low intensity type stuff. And this is typical. Again, you could have the anomalies like a Mike Mutzel or someone that's, you know, able to thrive on higher intensity exercise doing keto. Or is doing but it, such a healthy version of keto that like he's just nailing down the nutrition right. so well. Right. Again, because some of these studies, you know, what constitutes keto in some of these studies. But what what they found was essentially his whole, the whole underlying point is if you're doing low intensity stuff at, the, at around the same pace, you're not really changing speeds or doing anything different, that keto can work and that you can burn calories efficiently. But essentially he said that you can't burn fat very quickly. So if you're doing anything mo- moderate or high intensity, you want to have some carbs on board typically is, is essentially the whole bottom line of this really well executed podcast episode. So I'd, I'd highly recommend you check it out if you are coming from trying to figure out what works and what doesn't. And again, even your personal journey could be different than this, but it is very interesting he also had went on, and I remember him talking about this a lot, is that the Lakers went low carb and like mm. their performance completely tanked. And he said mm. it can't be caught totally cause and effect. Like you can't say it's totally cause and effect from keto, but their whole team changed diets. Mm. And from a year to year basis, their performance really slumped. And he was saying that basketball would be an awful sport to do keto with because you need rapid, fast it's movements. All Right, which requires more carb. So yeah. that makes sense. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting. So again, it might depend on the sport that you're doing. If you're walking and stuff, probably keto would be less problematic um, than doing if you were doing basketball or running or something more higher intensity. And again, this goes back to the, we're, we've been talking about this for a freaking hour, and I'm going to reiterate what I said at the beginning. Go back to Nutrition 101, Mm. or in this case, Nutrition 108 stuff. (laughs) This is literally what we learned in like intro Mm -hmm. to human nutrition class and in my exercise science classes. Everybody wants to pretend that they have like the secret sauce. Nobody's going to tell you the truth, but I'm going to tell you the truth. And I'm going to tell you that keto is perfect. Like everybody wants to pretend that they're so special that they have the answers and that you've been lied to otherwise. (laughs) But honest to God, 
it, I have my exercise physiology textbook still. I have this nutrition manual still from like 15, no, oh God, 18 years ago. And it's still largely true. Like this right. is the thing, endurance athletes need more carbs, lift like heavy lifting and power athletes need more protein. And it, and it's just, this is, we've known this guys, we have right. known this. So don't fall for the people who dangle the sexy secrets and the sexy carrot in front of you. True. By the way, sexy carrot could be a really good Halloween costume. I'm just saying. It could be. That might be something. I already had my Halloween costume picked out and figured oh, wow. out for this year. So I can't be the sexy carrot this year, but maybe next year. But anyway, like don't fall for that horseradish. Like don't fall for the clickbaity titles on YouTube and the people who think that they have the secret sauce and nobody else is going to tell you the truth and it's all a big conspiracy. Like we've, yeah. we've known this all along. Yeah. And I think, again, like if you are locking down your protein, fat, carb, from there, you can look at things like you can start getting more nuanced. So fiber, you can look at your micronutrition. How can you optimize micronutrients, which is huge because there's a lot of different ways that you could get in your calories or there's a lot of different ways that you can manipulate your macros, but um, and which could give you different micros. Um, or there, sorry, there, you could keep macros around the same, but manipulate those to get different micros. So if you know that you do best eating, you know, 30% fat, 40% carb, 30% protein, which would be fairly high protein. But if you knew that you, you did well eating that macro split, there's different, there's different inputs that you could use to get the micronutrients squared away. I have an example, if okay. I may. Yes, please. So... I love mayonnaise so much. Hmm. I just, I do. It's delicious. You and Armand both. It's creamy, it's tangy, it's everything it needs to be. And uh, like, so today for lunch, I had, I made tuna, like canned tuna. And I yeah. I put a big old glob of mayonnaise in it and a bunch of dill. And I had that and like an apple and I forget what else. And I got a lot of fat calories from that giant blob of mayonnaise. I could have gone a little bit more conservative on my very generous blob of mayonnaise and maybe gotten the same amount of fat from like half an avocado. Right. And the avocado is going to have fiber and potassium and God knows what else. Magnesium, maybe. Right. I feel like I remember that. Um, but you get more micronutrients from the avocado in this example or like nuts and seeds versus getting your fat calories from a big old glob of like butter or vegan butter or olive oil or mayonnaise Coconut oil yeah a lot but, of the added oils which again like can be great for cooking and can actually help if you need more calories and they're so, scrumptious right and they're scrumptious they make things taste good but i think you're right um you know if you're noticing you're getting a lot of calories from one added fat it might be beneficial to work in more nuts and seeds or olives versus just olive oil mm -hmm. or whatever it is. Like you could do different things there, but that's a really good example. I like that. Yeah. And very apropos because that was just today that I, I had that right. little blob so, of. And, and I will say too, like sometimes when I'm adding fiber to people's diets, if they're eating tons of rice, that was kind of an example before. Why don't you slowly start decreasing the rice portion and adding a portion of potato or sweet potato or buckwheat or yeah. whatever quinoa brown rice or whatever it is like something that has a little bit more fiber so that's something i do a lot um yeah but yeah chronometer is really fascinating because you can see the micronutrient data it can be a little sticky because if you're plugging in a lot of the packaged food items it doesn't it's not totally accurate. So you, you want to be a little cautious of living and dying by the chronometer micronutrient data. at least a ballpark, though. Right. Um, I have one more example, if I yeah. may, to just go on that, that. So we gave an example of carbs. We gave an example of fat. The protein one, if I got 20 grams of protein because I put collagen peptide protein powder in my oatmeal, that is going to increase my protein versus if I ate a burger or a steak, then I would get the iron and the zinc mm -hmm. and again, the other micronutrients from that food instead of the protein powder. Right, right, for sure. 
No, love that example. That rounds out the three. <laughs> that makes yeah. me happy that my slight twinge of OCD is, is like finishing out something or having that completeness. So that makes yeah. me happy now. Um, yeah. Let's, let's briefly talk about IBS diets. And again, we have, we have one whole episode at the tail end of season one. So it's like episode 97, uh, all about the low FODMAP diet specifically. And then we have the follow-up episode to that right after that, I think 98 is all about SIBO diets in general. And we talk about like biphasic SCD, the low FODMAP SCD hybrid. We talk about uh, the Cedar sinai diet, but I, and I'll say something and then I'll let the dietitian take the reins here. I feel like once you get the overall nutrition thing down pat, like what we just spent the last hour talking about, I think the, the logical next progression, if you're still symptomatic and you want to tailor it for your tummy problem specifically, you could do a modified version of low FODMAP. So you would just... Well, and before you say that... Okay. I would look at your other fundamental factors too. Like if you're still stressed to the max or something. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. I just wanted to point that out. Like if you have, if you're so honed in on like the diet piece, but your sleep is crap, I would still work on sleep and stress and movement versus jumping yeah. to, to low modified low FODMAP. That was yeah. my point. No, that's a valid point. Well, and honestly, I feel like I didn't even think to mention that because that was a lot of what we right. talked about last episode, right. but you're right. I actually think that that stuff should come somewhat largely before the nutrition manipulation just in general. Mm. But again, I think that the stuff we talked about for the last hour, most anybody could work on that and get some benefit, or at least it's not harmful to do what we just talked right. about. But yes, you've got to have your ducks in a row otherwise. And if you're still struggling with symptoms and you want to try to eliminate something, the modified version of low FODMAP um, is basically you you take out the highest of the high FODMAP foods and you only take those out or reduce them. So it's it's like onion, garlic, maybe wheat and like beans. That's yeah. it. That's nothing else. You're not removing anything else from your diet, but you just kind of dip your toe in the water and you see if that has any effect on you. And if it does, you know, you could just, settle right there. And maybe that's good enough for you. Um, I think that that, that opens the door for a conversation about maybe your motility stinks, maybe your digestive capacity stinks, like maybe you should mm. work on some of those other root causal factors. Because I I'm of the opinion, I think everybody should be able to tolerate FODMAPs and eat them with abandon. Right. So I don't think yeah. you stop there. But if you wanted more symptomatic improvement, you could work with somebody to do like a more stringent version of the elimination diet. But in my opinion, this is not something you work with a functional doctor on. This is not something for a nutritionist. This is something you want to go with a dietitian that you find on the Monash University website who's taken their dietitian training course, and they really, really, really know how to implement this tool, and you, they yeah. can guide you through it. Um, but that's probably all I have to say on that topic is you know, start with the modified. From there, it, there's a couple directions you could go, but I absolutely would not do low FODMAP without the assistance of a trained dietitian. Yeah. And I would say to your point earlier, the, the thing that can be so problematic from a diet standpoint, when you start getting these IBS diets is that they affect all the nutrition out, but all the nutrition we just mentioned, you know, you could just naturally be a little bit low carb if you cut out grains or cut out, you know, if you cut wheat. out wheat, right. So they can impact your ability to nourish your body from a fundamental standpoint, especially if you're avoiding a ton of stuff. I also think just your micronutrients can be really affected. I think thiamine, even if you're gluten free can be on the lower end, especially if you're removing beans and some of these other really high thiamine sources. So again, that's just one example. If you're removing a lot of these foods, it can be really problematic and fiber to, to nourish your body. Yeah, you've really got to be more mindful of fiber if you're doing low FODMAP. Right. All right. Yeah. Well, Cece's panicking, so I'm I'm muting for a second. Okay. 
Well, I was actually going to say that probably is a wrap, honestly. So do you want to wrap it up from here? Yeah. So I think just to, um, just to sum up. So we had analyzing your analysis, analyzing your relationship with food. So making sure that that's good. If it's not trying to do some interventions there. And we have a lot of podcast episodes on that. Um, the second thing would be making sure you're getting enough calories, then your macros, and then looking at maybe your micros. And and again, doing maybe something modified to help symptomatically. Yeah. The gentlest version of low FODMAP possible to start out with, especially if you're on your own. And mm-hmm. then if you want to restrict further from there, you really need the help of a dietitian who can watch out for these pitfalls and these these deficiencies and whatnot. Uh, again, I would not work with a functional person because they just, they suck at this. Right. Um, but yeah, yeah. I think that that's a wrap. So I, I would actually even give a slightly modified version of the executive summary. You, you gave more detail. I would say start with healthy nutrition for a human being, right? Because you want to be a healthy human being at the end of the day. And then once you get that all squared away and you're doing real, real good, then maybe you start thinking of nutrition specific to IBS. But that's like months down the line for most people in my finding. Yeah, for yeah. sure. That's all right. We spent over an hour talking about that. I could have just summarized it with the sentence or two that I just said. So sorry, not sorry for wasting your time. But you know, it is what it is. Right. You can find us on the gram at at amy underscore oh she's oh, boring herself i got a yawn amy underscore hollenkamp underscore rd yep and i am the self-proclaimed but nonetheless legitimate gut dot microbiome dot queen on instagram and youtube as well we will see you in the next episode of the podcast until then take care happy eating and uh go get you some calories